Every day in Iowa City, I see people in passing, and I think to myself, I wonder who that person is. Did he grow up here? Or did he come for college and end up staying because he got a grant for his research? Or maybe the love of his life? He's a townie. He decided. decided to raise their kids here. In Iowa City, today I see people I see people every day. And wonder, what's her story? And wonder, or what she does for a living. I see her around. And walking her dog. Maybe she's the writer of that, of that book I loved so much. Maybe she's a dancer. A chef. Iowa City is interesting like that. The guy sitting next to you on the bus could be your new favorite singer. That lady who helped held the door open for you could be a filmmaker. A politician. I see people. I see people every day and wonder. And what's wonder. What's your story? 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 After half a century of making music, Tony Brown has learned more than some nice guitar licks and a distinct vocal styling. Songs are his way of teaching what he has learned about life. Turning his meditations on life into live performance, he wants to inspire us all to practice the principle of unity, to see what we have in common so that we do good by the world. But how does Tony Brown stay positive in the face of all of life's trials? This is his story. So Tony, you were raised in Iowa, right? Yeah, yeah. raised in Waterloo. Spent some time bouncing around, you know here and there, but Waterloo was the Waterloo focus was point. Home. Yeah. And music was a part of your, your house? Uh, yeah, continuously. I remember my sister was in fact, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about me throwing stuff out of my crib because my crib was in the living room right next to the Magnavox stereo. And every Sunday it was a tradition to play jazz in the morning. So. Um, I used to, certain music used to get me kind of crazy, so I would just throw everything out of the crib. Yeah. So I started professionally at eight, but I started playing when I was six. So. How did you start professionally that young? What were you doing? I was tall. <laughs> I was tall. I was, and they take eyebrow pencil and make a little <laughs> mustache on me and sneak me out of the house. I had to jump out of the bathroom window on the second floor or, I, you know, like the great escape where you tie blankets together. And, and then my cousins would be in the alley with my change of clothes and I sneak through the bushes and I get in the car and they dress me up. And a lot of clubs I couldn't stand on stage. I had a, I was behind a curtain because I was very young. And what kind of music were you doing? That R&B. R&B. Show band. Wow. But I still had my steps and I still dressed and I still did everything behind the curtain. So after a while when people knew that, a lot of people, would, when the band would play, would kind of stand behind the curtain and watch me. And then the rest <laughs> of the crowd would be out there dancing and I'd be doing my steps and the twists and everything, you know? You were the secret member of the band. Yeah. And I mean, a couple of clubs I had to climb in the bathroom window. I had to wow. bring hot dogs for the guard dogs in the bag. <laughs> and climb in the bathroom window and change in the bathroom because it's kind of rough, but I was eight. I think somebody needs to make a movie about your life. That's the that greatest start that was, of the movie. Then my mom found out. Well, what I couldn't have that much money. I mean, it was like 30 bucks. 30 bucks was way too much money for a kid back then. So I'd hide it in one of her drawers and she wouldn't find it for weeks sometimes. Sometimes she'd find it the next day. Oh, I must have hid this money somewhere. And so she finally caught me, and she had to make a deal with my cousins. They could take me, <laughs> you know, like a dollar, you're loaning somebody a dollar. <laughs> they could take me, but they had to make sure I was home by a certain time and, and no alcohol and keep me away from all the... All the vices of... <laughs> well, so you... you showed promising talent young enough that your cousins were sneaking you out of the house. Oh yeah, they were sneaking me out of the house. That was, that was the earliest part of it. And then from that point on, it was either athletics or music. You have a message with your music. You know, whenever, whenever I've seen you perform or listen to your music, there's a, there's a social message, there's a political message, mm -hmm. um, there's a message of positivity in your music. When did all that come into play? What do you think brought that to the table for you? I just did not know how to, I misused my power so much that it took me years to regain the use of how to use it right to convey the right messages. Mm -hmm. A lot of praying and meditation to ask, to get the right words, to have the right message, and then to live what I was saying. That was one of the hardest things because 
as you know, as a musician, you're glamorized in yourself more so you're glamorized in other people's eyes. You, there's things that you shouldn't do, uh, which is number one, taking your abilities to entertain people and to get people's interest and use it for selfish causes. The vices of the, the ego that yeah, might come with being yeah. a performer. Right. And, and then the message of music, because you're speaking to such a large number of people, I feel is a blessing because of the fact that you have an opportunity to say something good. You have an opportunity to give people hope. Yeah. One of the things I've, I've heard you talk about as a performer is trying to sort of have, um, have people understand what we all have in common. Right. And, and, you know, that we do have a common suffering, but we, we have a, a world that we share. Right. And, and the importance of us realizing that mm -hmm. it's ours to share. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 that always really struck me as a, as a, a pretty big, strong, powerful message to try to put out there. But you work hard at getting that well, message out Well, because people try to find differences so they can empower themselves. Mm. If you have enough people identify with your differences, then you are empowered. If you have, if the commonalities are more expressed than the differences, then people have a reason to be together and to work together versus thinking of the differences. I mean, it's just like a, the yeah. only thing that compares the apple and the orange are people. Animals just eat them. <laughs> Apples and oranges don't know the difference. So it's only people that compare the differences between things and create these differences to segregate each other from the principle of unity. So that's what it's basically um, about, is finding ways to make people feel one. I think when we got to this earth, however we came here, that there was one great obstacle put before us. And the great obstacle was whether we could survive together mm. and survive with nature together. And if we do that, we survive. If we don't, maybe the aliens come down and go zap. <laughs> or maybe God sends a brimstone and fire and goes zap, you know, or Mother Earth herself might just go zap, you know. But um, the, principle, the, the greatest trial that we have is living together, not being powerful, not being wealthy, not being superior, it's a commonality of humanity, you know, so until we can do that, there's going to be war. And it's been said throughout history, you know, until that day that we as people see the commonality that we all share together, there's going to be war. Yeah. There's going to be greed, there's going to be everything that exists in the world right now. Well, and I think that plays into some of the environmental messages in your music yeah. as well, because, you know, when people are putting wealth before a best practice that would be better for the earth right, in right. terms of industry and, and all that. Well, if the earth's gone, what are we going to be good? What are we going to protect? I mean, how? What's your money going to? What's being right going to do for anything? If we don't take care, I don't care who you are, or what you say. If you don't take care of the earth, it doesn't matter because she doesn't have any mercy. <laughs> I mean, it's just like flies driving down, flying down a rope, smash, hits a car. That fly didn't even do anything. That's my, the nature is that way. And what we're doing is we're challenging that mm. by putting these humanistic values ahead of, of taking care of the earth. And we're just like that fly. I mean, screw, you better watch out. There's a big semi truck just looking for one fly, you know, going through life. And that's. That's who, who and what we are until we um, actually re-educate ourselves and re-educate the people that are listening to us and re-educate our children, and re-educate the educational system. So instead of preparing people to go in the industry to work and preparing to make money, we should teach people how to prepare to take care of the earth. How do you, how do you stay positive as this you know, little fly? going down the road with the semi coming, how do you stay positive and, 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 and energized to keep, to keep this message well, out there? I've lived in third world countries. 